Okay, um, we're going to start talking about Chapter 10 of our book um, by Eckhart, um, which is on printing. And, well, actually not. It's on Common Systems Administration Task, uh, the first of which includes printing. Um, the book has a whole section on printing, but I want to talk about printing in general before we start talking about anything in the book. Because um, printing, what you use for printing is you have to use software, or the print systems are software, that basically builds a queuing system that handles print jobs. The whole idea is when you have a printer, you can't have everybody printing to the system at, to the printer at the same time, or people's print jobs get messed up. You get, you know, if uh, Jane and Sally both send print jobs to a printer at the same time, and you don't have a queuing system, then page one of Jane's comes out, follow, followed by page one of Sally's, followed by page two of Jane's, or maybe page three is half of Jane, yeah, half of page three is Jane's and half of it's Sally's and, you know, it just doesn't work. So you need a queuing system that basically says Jane goes first or Sally goes first. And, um, and, and then the queuing system can get complicated because if Jane sends three books to the printer and it's going to tie it up all day, maybe you just don't want to send Jane's stuff through very quickly. You want to make Jane wait until midnight. Um, and Sally can print little jobs all day because Jane just doesn't go out until midnight. Um, so the basic idea is these queuing systems can get fairly complicated. And um, and they um, they do what we need to do with printers. However, the queuing systems can be used for a lot more than printers. And I want to talk about what a printer is for just a little bit, because generally there's a lot of devices that we set up with as printers, other than printers, and. Um, Although there's been a tendency in recent years to think of printers as just being printers, I want to talk about printers in a little more general form. Suppose I have a pin plotter like, um, oops, like, like something here. Here's a pin plotter from the old days. Um, here's a nicer picture of it. Yeah, it looks something like that. I think we've all seen pin plotters of that type uh, years and years ago. Maybe maybe we see them in um, thrift stores today at Free Geek or something like that. Um, we used to use these pin plotters before we had such good electrostatic plotters uh, printers that we can. Or I'm sorry, um, not electrostatic. I'm I'm living back in the 1980s. Before we had such good um, laser printers that we could use, especially color laser printers and dot matrix printers that are really, really um, um, have fine resolution and things come out good. Prior to that, we used pin um, uh, plotters where the, there were actually physical pins and you could choose a pin and the pin would come up and it would uh, press down. Um, it, 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 uh, the color that you wanted, and then it would just kind of move on the paper, or else the paper would move under the pen one way or the other. Or in the case of HP pen plotters, the paper moved in one direction, the pen moved in the other direction, and uh, by doing the two, you could make a nice pen plot. Of course, that made it very hard to fill in fill areas because a pen plotter wasn't very good filling uh, filling areas. It was more better at outline printing, um, which is one reason why we have moved away from pen plotters to um, what I call raster plotters today, the uh, laser plotters and thing, uh, laser printer slash plotters and things like that. Um, and but. But in the old days, we used a lot of pin plotters. As another example of a pin plotter, 
I think, is this thing here, which indeed I used um, plotters that looked a lot like this for many, many years. Uh, this one was made by CalComp Corporation. Um, I actually, CalComp made a lot of pin plotters. I guess I did use a few of them. I never used a big, huge flatbed plotter like this by CalComp. The ones I used were by uh, Gerber. I don't think it's the same people that make baby food, but yeah. Um, and they were they were a lot of fun. And the truth is, they did beautiful work. They were slow and expensive to use and more expensive to buy. But the work was as good as anything you would get today. In many cases, I think the quality of the work was actually better. The software tended to be very primitive, um, at least to begin with. Um, and um, it was a venture writing um, plotting software. I was doing that back in the 19, early 1980s, early to mid 1980s. And believe me, it was, no, I'm sorry, uh, mid 1970s. And um, it, it was an adventure, but uh, uh, certainly taught one how to program. Um, I've got another picture here, which is a bit of a distraction, but um, this is a picture that I found on the same website from, I guess, the 1970s. I just talked a little bit about, in the previous video, I may have mentioned something about people using digitizing tables to capture vector data, vector graphics data. In the back of this room here is a gentleman sitting down looking um, with his eyeball through a little magnifying glass and moving this um, pocket up and down on this big, huge table. That was a digitizing table um, or digitizing tablet. And then companies like CalComp made hundreds of those. And people sat, spent hours and hours tracing lines with a digitizing da table to capture vector data for uses like um, um, computer-aided design uh, and uh, geographic information systems. So um, I, I, here's another fun thing that I just found. Um, you can see the URL up here. Uh, this is a modern pin plotter. <coughs> well, made entirely out of Legos. And um, it's kind of a cool device. It's um, And you can see from this very clearly how the pin plotters work. And, um, and you have the same problem with a pin plotter as a printer in that you want only one person at a time can send data to this machine because you, you need a queuing system. So one person controls the thing. And that's why many of us would set pin plotters up as, um, as um, printing devices using the print spool cues. And um, you can see, well, this, this moves a pen and draws with the pen. And um, yeah, well, that's kind of cool. If you want, you can go to that yourself and watch the rest of it. Um, but we still, and one reason I dwell on pin plotters is we still use pin plotters today. Only today, the pins are doing much more interesting things. They're running uh, other type. Instead of putting pins on the, the turret that has the pin, had the pin for the pin plotter, we're putting things like, um, let's see, this, these are 3D printers. Um, let's see what we've got here. Well, what we're doing is we're putting things like router blades. Um, and um, um, a little hot um, nozzles that can extrude plastic so that we can actually build, device, uh, build um, statues and stuff and build parts for machines um, using a, something that moves very much like a pin plotter, only, in sti only as well as being able to move the pin on a flat surface like this, it can also move the pin up 
So it's three-dimensional. So um, you can build up layers on layers of plastic and stuff. Or you can cut down by, if you've got a router blade and thus cut away at an object. Um, let's go back here. We'll take a look at another one. Whoop! That, well, that's a device made by one of these guys. Um, that's pretty good. Needs painted, but uh, um, OK. And these are becoming readily more available all the time. Here's some others. I thought there ah, here. This is um, something called the Mindle. It's a, a rip. What do they call it? A a rip wrap, Mindle rip wrap. I've seen these in action. Uh, the design of them are open source. You can build them. A lot of them are ran off Linux computers, and um, they're a really cool device. I've sometimes thought about building one. I, it might cost probably about $500 to build one of these things. And they will actually, once you've got one built, they will build many of the parts you need to build another one, um, which is why they call them Mindo, is because they're kind of you know, uh, genetic in nature. They build themselves. Well, that's an exaggeration. But, um, but they're really a cool device. And this is a three-dimensional uh, or a, a 3D um, printer. Um, and it basically has a hot um, glue gun type thing that can melt plastic, and it will build up layers of plastic. And um, um, and um, by building up layers of plastic, it can make parts and devices. And it's pretty good at it. Um, here's another one here. This one's called a MakerBot. MakeBot, ma yeah, MakerBot. And uh, you can buy these. I think they're, uh, I think ready built. They're a couple thousand dollars, but um, but you can buy kits and build them yourself, and they're a lot cheaper than that. Um, so that, and once again, these are essentially a um, um, a printer. So printers are a very modern device. We'll be using them for a long time, and we'll be using the print cubes. Oh, here's some other ones. In this case, this is a numerical controlled machine. You see the pin plotter type mechanism, only it's got a router. Um, actually, it's got a plasma cutter on the end of this. So you can basically cut steel using this machine and make parts by cutting them out of steel. So it's, and once again, it's computer controlled. It's, you know, um, pretty cool device. I wish I could afford one. Um, Oh, and this is just more stuff on on uh, numerical controlled uh, devices. See in uh, or uh, look up on the internet or on the Google. Just look up CNC devices if you want to find out more about that, or else Google for 3D printers. One of those two. Okay. Um, I guess that's pretty much everything I had to say about the way we use printers and why printers are important. And um, we'll end this section of the print of the video here, and then we'll come back and actually talk more about um, the software that we use and how you control the software we use for um, setting up print systems in Linux or actually any Unix. So, okay, bye bye.